So we're starting a new section, electricity and magnetism. And I like to start out by sort of uh, giving you the big picture, <laughs> how physicists view the world. So the idea here is to describe, physicists want basically the two fundamental questions. What's the world made of and what holds it together? Right? That's what it all comes down to. So I want to just give you an overview so you know where we are in, in the big picture. So we have what we call the standard model. I should put that over here. The standard model. What's the world made of? Well, we have what we call fundamental particles. What does that mean? It means we can't break them open and find smaller particles inside of them. So maybe a number of years ago, the fundamental particle they, they believed was a molecule. And they thought things were made up of molecules. And then maybe we figured out that we could break mo molecules up into atoms. Maybe we thought for a while that atoms were fundamental. If you wanted to build a block of gold, you needed a bunch of gold atoms, right? Put them together. So we realized we could break up atoms. Inside the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons, and there are these electrons that orbit around the outside that, that make this cloud around the outside. So for a while, that was our, those were our fundamental particles. Those were our building blocks. Then we realized we could break up protons and neutrons. There are quarks in there. So right now, our belief is that the world is made up of quarks, six quarks and six antiquarks. And six leptons and six antileptons. And so quarks and antiquarks, well, not antiquarks, quarks, <laughs> protons and neutrons are made of quarks. And what's the most famous lepton? The electron. So we don't believe we can break up an electron into smaller components right now, right? It's the, it's the smallest, one of our smallest building blocks. We don't believe we can break up quarks. Who knows? Maybe we'll discover we can one day. Right now, this is our model. So that's, that's what the world is made of. And how is it held together? We've got forces, right? Forces. Physicists would love it if a force was a force, right? There was one kind of force. If you know, it doesn't matter what the manifestation is, if it was gravity pulling on you or two balloons that are electrically charged pushing on each other, those are both forces, right? Physicists would love it if, if at the very fundamental level, all forces were caused by the same thing. We're not there yet. <laughs> Maybe it's not true. That's just the way physicists would like it to work out. But they're trying to dig down deeper and deeper into forces and see what really is the fundamental cause of each force. So if we were to list a bunch of forces, just name something. A force. Which one? Tension in a string, okay. 
let's see, that would be, um, I guess I would put that into this category. Anything else? Gravity. And also in that, we've got sort of our centripetal force and Okay, what else? Okay, magnetism. Electric force. How about friction? Okay, what else we've got? And there's a couple we haven't learned about. Uh, some nuclear, at the nuclear level. There's a weak force. And there's also another force that we call the strong force. Okay, so if we start bunching these together, these first couple, we, we call those gravitational forces. And then friction, tension in a string, charged objects, electric forces, we would group all those together and say those are all electromagnetic in nature. And then there's the weak force. The weak force is responsible for certain types of radioactive decay. And then there's the strong force. Why do we call it the strong force? Because it's a strong force. That's exactly right. We're not very imaginative, except, I guess, when it comes to naming elementary particles, right? The quarks and things like that. They've got some crazy names. But, um, but the strong force, because what are protons? They are all positively charged objects, right? Protons are all positively charged. But in the nucleus of an atom, they're all held together. Try to squeeze positively charged objects together. What do they want to do? repel each other, right? We haven't learned that yet. You're going to learn that today. <laughs> like charges repel each other, but all those positive protons are squeezed together in a tiny little space in the nucleus of an atom. So that means there must be an even stronger force, and the electric force that causes them to repel each other is very strong. So there must be a bigger, more powerful, stronger force holding them together than the electric force wanting to push them apart. That's why we call it the strong force. That's the force that holds the protons together in, in a nucleus. So this, is, this was our view a few years ago. We've, we've got it down to four basic fundamental forces. You can, at, at the very fundamental layer, there are four ways that forces can manifest themselves. And a few years ago, they actually linked two of these, the electromagnetic and the weak force. They now they call that the electroweak. So we're down to three now. So physicists would love it if they could find one fundamental thing that was sort of the cause for every force. But we're not there yet. We've got it down to three. The gravitational force, the electroweak force, and the strong force. Or you can just think of the four there. That's OK, too. Um, and you might say, well, how does a force manifest itself? How do two objects know that they're exerting a force on each other? And our model is that there's some kind of a carrier particle that goes back and forth between the two objects and lets them know that they are interacting with each other and, and makes that force manifest itself. One way to picture that is sort of using a momentum analogy. You have two people standing on a, a sheet of ice, with maybe with ice skates on. Two ice skaters standing on a sheet of ice. Low friction, right? And they start throwing a ball back and forth to each other. I throw the ball to you. You catch it, throw it back to me. After a couple of throws, what's happening? We're moving apart, right? We're moving apart from each other. So it's as if we are repelling each other. And this ball we're throwing back and forth is the carrier particle that's telling us we're repelling each other <laughs> and enabling that force to manifest itself. So because we know something about momentum, you can picture that, right? But it's hard to picture some particle going back and forth 
and causing us to attract each other, isn't it? But that's our model. Our model is that there's some particle that goes back and forth, the carrier particle, and that is what causes the force to manifest itself. So what are the carrier particles for all of these? For the strong force, can you guess what we call it? <laughs> A gluon. Now it's obvious, isn't it? Strong force, it is a gluon, is the par carrier particle. We've discovered those. For the electroweak force, it's the photon. And for the gravitational force, we haven't found it yet. We're looking for it, haven't discovered it yet, but we have a name for it. It's called a gravitron. yet to be discovered. So some people sort of jokingly say that gravity is the force we know the least about. You might think that that was the first force we, we figured out existed, <laughs> the force of gravity, but that's the one we sort of know the least about because we, don't, we haven't yet discovered the gravitron, but we've, uh, we've discovered the carrier particles for the other ones. So the standard mar model works beautifully in describing how these forces work, and predicting things. It, the standard model predicted some things before we discovered them, and we've since discovered them. So the standard model is pretty well accepted in the world of physics. All right, so where are we? Last quarter, we did, we did uh, some of these, right? Gravity, centripetal force, friction, tension. We kind of covered that first part there. And you can see it, it overlaps a little bit uh, between the two two force types, gravity and electromagnetic. And this quarter, we're doing magnetism and, electro, and electric force. And that's what we're starting with today is the electric force. Okay, I just kind of wanted to show you in the big picture where we stand. And why are we studying this? Well, it's pretty fundamental to a lot of things. Electricity. It's pretty fundamental. Everything is made up of charged particles, right? The nucleus of every atom is a ball of positive charge, and surrounding it is an electric uh, charge, that's the opposite direction, a cloud of electrons, that's the opposite charge. So because of that, it is fairly easy, we'll talk about that today, how we can make objects electrically charged. Because right now, most things are neutral. They have that ball of positive charge has a certain magnitude of charge, right? And the, the cloud of electrons around the outside is exactly opposite and cancels it out. So most things are electrically neutral. But it's not too difficult to cause them, as you may know if you've ever taken socks out of a dryer, right? they become electrically charged in there, they stick together electrostatically. So it's not too difficult to get electric charges to transfer objects to become electrically charged. And then we have to deal with those uh, forces that, that come about. So we'll talk about that. Everything is made up of charged objects, so that's why one reason it's important. And then we use it right, for so many things. We use it for so many things. An example I like to throw out there, you want to go visit your friend. Car, train, plane, not without electricity, you're not going to get any of those to work, right? So you say, well, I'll call them up. Not without electricity, <laughs> right? You say, well, I'm just going to walk down the street and talk to them. Not without electricity, because how do your muscles work? Electrical impulses, right, cause your muscles to work. Electrical impulses in your body. You can't even think about calling them, right? It's electrical impulses in your brain. I know what you're thinking. Even with electricity, sometimes it's hard to think about things. But uh, 
You need electricity for everything. It's in us, it's part of us, it's how our bodies work. Very important. All right. Um, all kinds of applications, both in, you know, just home electronics, uh, communications, medical devices, all kinds of things. Okay, so let's get started. The basics. The basics. We've got two types of charge, at least that we know about. And we could have, uh, could have named them anything. A and B, <laughs> up and down. Could have named them anything. We decided positive and negative. The positive charge is the charge on the nucleus, right, in the proton. The proton has a positive charge to it, and so the nucleus has the positive charge, and you've got this cloud of electrons around the outside that have the negative charge. The electrons have the negative charge. This is from the proton, and that's from the electron. A couple of other terms, let's just throw out there. Conductor. A material where the electrons can move freely. Insulator. Uh, the electrons are tightly held to the nucleus of the atom they're associated with, so they, are, they cannot move freely. Electrons cannot move freely. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about how charges get transferred from one object to another. So objects, the atoms want to hold on to their electrons. But some atoms want to hold on to their electrons a lot tighter than other atoms. If you've taken chemistry, maybe you've learned about the uh, triboelectric series, you can see right, which atoms, what materials like to hold on to their electrons really tightly and what, which ones don't. 